So, would you agree with me if I made the statement uh, that there's power in stories? Would you agree with me to say that there, there's power in stories? I, I, I certainly believe there is. It's like, you ever watch, well, I was going to say a group of children, but, but even a group of adults who are listening to a well-told story, like just a, a, a great story. Maybe you, you can see, just watch their faces. You can see how just their, their faces light up and smile at the, at the same moments, at the, at the funny moments. Uh, you can see how just the concern on their faces as, as something, something difficult or, or dangerous happens. There's power in stories. We say that the people are, are sometimes spellbound, you know, if they're, they're listening to this, this story or watch people watching a, a, a good movie. You ever watch people watching a movie? See, their, their, their faces kind of are, are actually re- responding to what they're seeing going on on, on screen because we're, we're, we're spellbound is, is a phrase that we use. Spellbound means there's power, right? It's not an actual spell. It's not actually like some kind of magic, but, but it almost kind of is. There's power. There's power in stories. And that's what, that's what we're talking about in, uh, in our series as we talk about the, the revolution story. The power in a good story, and I think this is especially true in the story of and the stories of Jesus. Jesus, uh, his life-changing story and his life-changing stories were absolutely revolutionary. Revolutionary, because these were stories and this was a story that, that, that turned things, that changed things that actually had the power to turn things upside down, turn things around. And that's what we're talking about in this series. We're talking about the parables of Jesus. He had this wonderful way of of teaching where he would uh, draw comparisons just so naturally with things that that we see and and know in the world around us. Uh, These these parables, this, this way of teaching. But Jesus' parables... Understand, I think sometimes we have this, this way of thinking that his parables were like fables. You know, like Aesop's fables or something. There's a moral uh, in, in these fables. They're, they're about teaching a moral truth. Now, there may be moral truth that we can get from some of Jesus' parables. But understand, that's not what they're about. Jesus' parables were not about teaching a moral truth. They're about teaching that the kingdom of God, this was his central message throughout, the kingdom of God, that, that place, that, that, that special way in which God is king and is becoming king in the world and in our hearts and in our lives. Jesus' parables were about showing that the kingdom of God is at hand. That the kingdom has come, that the king has come. Well, if we talk about stories, every good story, and we talked about this a little bit last week, every good story has a hero or the technical sort of English literature term would be has a protagonist. Uh, and every good story has that, and that's, that's great. But did you know that every good story also has not just a hero, but has, well, the anti-hero, or the bad guy, has the antagonist. Uh, I mean, think about it this way. Um, I don't have the clicker, so Donna, I'm going to ask you just as I go through, just as I, as I indicate, can you do these next slides for me? So what would, think about the protagonist, and the antagonist. What would, what would Captain Ahab be without Moby Dick? Right? Who would, uh, what's my next one? Who would, what kind of story would we have if Luke didn't have Vader and Skywalker? What kind of story would we have if, if Neo didn't have Agent Smith? <laughs> my wife's laughing at me because that's, you might not know that reference, but that's The Matrix. That's the, like the best movie ever. Okay, we can talk about that later if you want to dispute that. The best movie ever. Okay, but anyway, and, and of course, more importantly than that, who would Bugs be without Elmer Fudd, right? We have the protagonist and we have the antagonist. And without the antagonist, you would have a very dull story because there'd be no tension, there'd be no conflict, there'd be nothing that really needed to happen or needed to be done. You can just go on to the next one. We'll, we'll leave it at, at, at that one for the rest there. But here's what I want to suggest. We need to know uh, about the antagonist. We need to, to know who the antagonist is and how to respond to the antagonist. And that's especially true as we talk about the stories of Jesus. Because those of us who are seeking to live out the story of Jesus in our lives, 
need to recognize that, that we face some of the same antagonism and the same antagonist uh, in our lives as well. So we need to be able to know and recognize uh, the antagonist and how to respond to that. So as we talked uh, last week, uh, as we read our story from Mark chapter 3 last week, we introduced, we, we saw some of the conflict that was being introduced uh, into the story. And this week we're going to take that further. The conflict has definitely been introduced and i uh, going to take it a little bit further. And as I read this next story, which is Mark 3, verses 20 to 35, I want you to listen and I want you to think about who is the antagonist or who are the antagonists in this story, uh, in these stories, in this passage. Okay? And uh, then we're going to talk together about that uh, some more afterwards. But before we read, let's just take a moment and pray. Lord God, we are privileged... Um, to open this book, which is more than uh, just words on a page. This is not just an ancient document, Lord. We believe that this is your living word uh, to us and through us. And so, Lord, we pray that by the presence of your Holy Spirit, you would open our hearts, our minds, our eyes to, to see you, to know you, to receive the truth that you have for us uh, in this uh, scripture reading today. So come, Holy Spirit. Touch our, our hearts, touch our ears as we listen and as we receive your word. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So I'm just going to read the whole passage. Again, this is Mark 3, verses 20 to 35. Feel free to follow along in your pew Bibles if you'd like to, or just listen in as, as I read. So then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered. It was a large crowd, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, he, he's out of his mind. And the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem said, he's possessed by Beelzebul, by the prince of demons, he's driving out demons. So Jesus called them over and began to speak to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom can't stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man's house. Truly, I tell you, people can be forgiven all their sins and every slander they utter, but... Whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. He said this because they were saying he has an impure spirit. Well, then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him and they told him, Your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Well, who are my mother and my brothers? He asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. Amen. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word today. So who, who's the antagonist in the story, you think? Is it the... The teachers of the law, call them, they're pretty antagonistic. Or even, we'll go a little deeper, a little further, is it his family? Is his family the antagonist in this story? I say, in a, in a pretty direct way in, the, in these stories, I would say, yes, we can call them antagonists in this story in the more immediate sense, but there's something about this story that draws the curtain back on, well, literally, someone who's kind of behind the curtain, you know that scene from the Wizard of Oz? The, the wizard is in, is in behind the curtain. You pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Someone here is behind the curtain, behind the scenes, but active and antagonistic, being an antagonist in the life of Jesus. Uh, goes by many names here in this story. The teachers of the law call him Beelzebul, which means Lord of... Actually, they're not even exactly sure. I saw lots of different meanings as to what Beelzebul means. But basically, the, the prince of demons... Jesus calls him, more simply, Satan, the accuser. 
There is someone behind the curtain being an antagonist to Jesus, and we need to learn to recognize and know uh, who the antagonist is and, and how to deal with them. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Now, we have different views of Satan sometimes. Uh, some people believe that Satan is, is a personal being, a uh, personal form of evil, and, and uh, believe in Satan very literally. Some believe that Satan is kind of a, an image, a metaphor, for the presence of evil in our hearts. I want to suggest that I'm not going to go down that road. I never do, because I'm, I'm not sure that, that I can ever solve that argument uh, between people who see that differently. I, I personally believe that, that Satan is a, is a personal being. Uh, a, a demonic force in the world. But, but I want to suggest that however you see it, either way, I want to suggest that there is truth and value in this message uh, for us today. Because whether we, we see it as uh, difficult, problematic, evil things that are happening, or whether we, we see that it, it, diff, difficult, problematic, evil things that are happening because of a personal uh, a being named Satan or Lucifer or whatever you want to call him, Beelzebub, uh, the, the reality of the difficulty, the reality of the, the, the evil, the reality of the conflict, the reality of, of broken relationships, all of those things uh, are still at work either way. So Satan may not always come to us uh, as we'd expect either. Uh, there is this great song. I, I, it was popular when I was a kid, so I'd hear it on the radio, but... Uh, uh, I'm not going to sing it for you. I don't have my guitar on or anything. But the, the chorus goes like this, or the words go like this. Somebody's knocking. Should I let him in? Lord, it's the devil. Would you look at him? I've heard about him. But I never dreamed he'd have blue eyes and blue jeans. There's a woman sort of saying about the, the, the temptation. He would assume that, that Satan, the devil, would, would be obviously bad and ugly. And, but no. Actually, she says, no, he's quite attractive. And uh, has a way of, of coming and, and wanting to, to come in. So it's not always what we would expect. But however we view uh, Satan, just know that, uh, that the difficulty, that the, the evil things that, that come as a result, they're things that we need to recognize, things that we need to learn to, to come to terms with and come to grips with. So let's look at this story uh, a little bit more closely. See, it's interesting how he starts off with Jesus' family, just for a couple of verses. Then uh, Mark tells us the story about uh, Jesus and the teachers of the law, or the, the scribes, as they're also known, uh, and then comes back to Jesus' family uh, at the end. He does this in a few places uh, in, in the Gospel of Mark. And I think one, I mean, could just be, well, that's just how it happened, yeah. But it's also just the form, the, the, the literary form, is to show these stories are connected in some way. It's this kind of sandwich uh, form that, that he uses to say, hey, these stories, they don't look like they might have something to do with each other, but actually they do. They're, they're connected. And so we need to, to recognize that and be, be ready for that. How are they connected? We also need to recognize the connection to the larger story. Sometimes when we read the Bible, we just focus in so much on this one little passage that we're looking at, but understand it's part of this larger story. Jesus has been going around uh, doing exorcisms. He's been driving demons out of people. He's been healing people uh, who are sick. And there was a, a strong connection uh, between the presence of, of evil and, and demons and the presence of sickness and, and mental sickness, mental illness as well. These things were all very closely connected and are all very closely connected. So Jesus has come and he has authority over these things. So he's beginning to kind of work into, you know, Satan's territory. Uh, and then that, that's why there, he gets this accusation. Oh, he's, by the prince of demons, he drives out demons. And we'll come to that a little bit further in a moment. So it's become clear that the scribes, the teachers of the law, they don't want this new thing that Jesus uh, is offering, that he's bringing. And so in response to Jesus, what they've taken up doing is, well, this, as you can see, this age-old technique of vilifying, of name-calling, and of actually, I want to use the term dehumanizing. Uh, he's not a... A teacher, he's not a rabbi. He's, he's not a, a man, or let alone a good man. He's a demon, they say. They dehumanize him. They name call him. They, they're trying to make it easier for people to turn against him. Trying to make it easier really for themselves to, to, to hate him and, and, and put him down. You know, he's Beelzebul. He is the prince of demons. That's why he can do these things. You can see that this is a technique that is not only at work 
in our world today, although we see it definitely at work in our world today as well, don't we? If we can dehumanize, if we can kind of say this person, this group, these people are somehow less than, what makes it easier for us to turn our hearts against them? And that's the technique that the the scribes are using uh, in this passage here. We can see it in some pretty extreme examples. We could see it, want to go back to Nazism in in, uh, uh, 1930s Germany and how uh, opinion turned against the Jews and other people groups and how they were uh, set aside. You can see it in the Japanese Canadians and Japanese Americans during the Second World War also. You can see it in some ways uh, in, in the treatment of uh, illegal immigrants in, in the, the, the southern part of the U.S. I'm not making a statement on whether they should be or shouldn't be in the country, or out of the country, but the way they're being treated uh, is, is sometimes almost, almost subhuman. And, and so that, that's a problem. You need to, need to worry about some of those things. Uh, but we, this is what we see happening. They're dehumanizing, they're vilifying, they're name-calling. Uh, you ever wonder why online dialogue, if you ever get involved with like social media and you see like on, on Facebook sometimes, or anything, you ever wonder why the, the conversation sometimes gets so angry and so vitriolic all of a sudden, so quickly? Well, because you're not dealing with people, you're just dealing with avatars, you're dealing with screens, you're dealing with, with words on a screen, and it's easy to, to separate and, 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 and distance. So this is what's going on here. But in all of this, Really, ultimately, the point I want to make in this, and all of this, and the harsh words and angry words and, and, and the bitterness and the attacks, the antagonist, capital A, the antagonist, is at work. Satan is at work. Now, Jesus' response, when we look at Jesus' response in this passage, I've got to say, Jesus' response, as always, is awesome. Love the way Jesus responds to to people and and conflict and and difficulty. His response is amazing. It's awesome. First of all, he just uses simple logic to to totally dismantle what the the scribes, the teachers of the law are saying. Okay, so you're saying that I'm Satan and I'm attacking the works of Satan. Uh, You know, where's the logic in that? A kingdom divided against itself can't, you know, if the king uh, is at work and, you know, sends out things against his, his own work, the kingdom's not going to stand. A house divided against itself is not going to stand, you know. So it's just very simple logic. It's almost like he's teaching children. Okay, let's go back to our logic lessons here, children. Not going to work. It just doesn't work that way, okay. And more than that, even more awesome, he shows them that, okay, let's even say that what, what you're saying is true. If it's true, then Satan's kingdom is toppling. Satan's kingdom can't stand. And guess what? Jesus, guess what his message is that he's come? The kingdom of God is at hand. Satan's kingdom is toppling. His message, I mean, that's his message. He's saying, okay, let's say you're right. I'm totally paraphrasing here. Let's say you're right. Satan's kingdom is toppling, which means God's kingdom is at hand. Again, his response is, love it. It's awesome. So then secondly, uh, it then goes into, again, his, his kind of style of teaching. He tells a parable. He tells this little short little story about, about the strong man. Verse 27 he tells a story about the strong man. Just one single verse. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man's house. He gives this image. You, you, can, you can see it. It's all kinds of movies or things that come into our minds. The strong man who needs to be overcome. Uh, but who is the strong man in, in this story? Who is the strong man? Well, there's an obvious answer, and we've already been talking about it. The strong man is Beelzebub, the prince of demons, Satan, the, 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 the presence and power of, of evil and, and, and difficult and dark things that are happening in our lives and in the world. Satan is the strong man. And so in Jesus, a stronger man, has arrived. One who is able to go in and, and tie up the ultimate antagonist. Again, we've said that the exorcisms and, and healings and things that he's been about are the proof of this. He has authority. He has the power. We have seen, we are seeing the breaking of Satan's power, the breaking of the power of darkness and evil. So to defeat the strong man, Satan, the accuser, the evil one, the presence of evil in our lives. To defeat the strong man, we need a stronger man. And the stronger man in Christ has come. 
So again, something new is happening. Jesus is this something new. But again, there's more to this. There's more to, to the story. There's more to Jesus' parable. The strong man, uh, the strong man has come into our houses. Strong man isn't just in his own house. Jesus hasn't just come and, and, and tied up Satan in this universal way. What I want to say is the strong man has come into your house. The strong man has come into my house. The strong man who needs to be tied up isn't only in his own house. He's in ours. And that's why there's an, a, a need for, for rescue in the first place. Satan is at work in our houses. And so who's the one that's tied up? Satan has come into our houses to tie us up. Satan is at work in our hearts, in our relationships, in our circumstances through these things. He's at work in these things to, to tie us up, to, to cripple us. In fact, there's a story uh, told in one of the other Gospels about a crippled woman who, who comes to be healed by Jesus. And, and uh, the way Jesus refers to her, he says, that this woman has been bound by Satan for 18 years or however long it is that, that she's been crippled like this. Should she not be freed? It was a story about healing on the Sabbath. The teachers of the law were saying, don't heal on the Sabbath, that's not allowed. He says, she's been bound by Satan all these years. Shouldn't she also be free? Satan is at work in these things, in our lives, in our houses. How about pretty well-known words that Jesus says to one of his closest friends one time? When he speaks against what Jesus is doing, when Simon Peter speaks against it, Jesus turns and says to him, get behind me, Satan. Because he sees, he knows that Satan is at work. And the things sometimes that we think are, are for the best, are, are for the good. Satan can be at work in those things. Satan is at work in our houses. His goal is to tie us up, to make us weak, to make us ineffective. He uses lures of the heart to draw us into these things. He uses the lures of, of, uh, of desire. He uses... Uh, our, our, our emotions to get us all tied up uh, in ourselves and, and with one another. The goal is not to reject desires. The goal is not to reject emotions. But we do need to know how these things are at work and how they're affecting us and others around us. And we need to submit them. We need to bring them into the kingdom of God where Jesus shows us and tells us, here's what desires are about. Here's what emotions are about. Here's what life is about. So again, this is all in, in Jesus' story about the strong man and, and the coming of the stronger man. I want to suggest there's, there's another way. There's, there's more to this story still because if Satan has come into our house to plunder our house to get us all tied up and Jesus has come to tie up the strong man what he then goes on to do is, is once he sort of helps untie us, he says, guess what? Now you are the stronger man, the stronger person, the stronger one who is able and has the authority power to tie up that old strong man. You know, if we were to go back in Mark chapter 3, back just, just a few verses uh, to, to, to verse 15, we, we didn't read this passage, but here he's calling the 12 apostles. And we can see in his call to them, ultimately, is sort of the call that comes down to us as followers of Jesus as well. In verse 15, he's talking about how he's appointing these 12 to preach, to teach, to be with him, and what else? He gives them the authority to drive out demons. So Jesus' followers, you and I, actually, as we are untied... We are, we are made strong in Christ. That we become the stronger man, able to, in the name of Jesus and by his authority, to reject and to put the, the, the plans of, of Satan, to, to put the works of evil in their place. In Christ, we have the authority. We are active participants with the authority of Christ. All who call on the name of Christ to accept him as their Lord, guess what? You now have that authority. It's like this. And I don't like to use military images very much. Uh, sometimes they can be, they have been not used well uh, in, in church history. Uh, but there's a military image that comes to mind in this. Imagine 
that you're like, you're like a, a lowly cor- corporal or private in, in the army. Okay, and, and you're in a hostile situation. You have to go into this house and, and kind of lock things down. You go in, you, you sort of go, go in, the, and there's armed people there, and, and you tell them, put down your weapons, uh, you know, but you're not cowering and in fear. You, you speak it with authority. Why? Because behind the private is the corporal. Behind the corporal is the sergeant, you know. Behind the, the sergeant and the officers are the, 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 the technology, the, the weapons of, of war. I guess I'm probably thinking of the U.S. military more than the Canadian military uh, when I say this. But, you, you, know, uh, you know, ultimately all the way back to, you know, the, the, the Pentagon and, and, and nuclear weapons and, and smart missiles and cruise missiles and things like that. You go in with authority, not because you're a lowly private with your, your machine gun, but because you have all of that behind you, supporting you, with you. So in a similar kind of way, it is with us. We go in in the name of Jesus, and we have, know that we have his authority and his power with us and behind us. Satan is in the business of tying us up. The antagonist is at work in our hearts and our lives. But in Christ, the tables have turned. This, this revolution has taken place and is taking place. The, the last part of his teaching here goes into this idea of this, this unforgivable sin, verses 28 to 30. And I'm just going to spend a, a few minutes on this. I, I, I think there's been a misunderstanding about this unforgivable sin. It's like you need to make sure there's like certain words you can't say. You know, if, if I say that or whatever, then, then I, suddenly it's like, well, I, now I can never be forgiven because I've said those words or I did that thing. Um, I believe that we're not talking here about certain words or deeds that you might say that you might do. What we're talking here is about a heart level, just complete rejection of Jesus. About saying that what Jesus has come to bring is actually evil and demonic. And... and that the, the, And the problem with that, once we label the work of Jesus as evil and demonic, then everything we see is going to back, back that up. Everything we see is going to prove the conclusion that we've already come to. And that, be, once we get to that point, then we won't be open to receiving any forgiveness anyways. It's kind of like, think of it this way. If, if you go to a doctor... You kind of need to trust the doctor in order to get any benefit from the doctor. Let me use an extreme example. If you go to a doctor, or if you, there's a doctor that you believe is a sadistic murderer, right? You're not going to go to the doctor and submit to his care. If you believe that the doctor is bad, you're not going to go. You're, you're not going to follow through, right? Well, it's the same thing here. If you believe that Jesus is, is evil, if you believe, then, then you're not going to submit to him, and, and, and you're going to remove yourself from the life that he comes to bring this is serious business because there is no middle ground when it comes to jesus we accept him or we reject him and if we reject him we will miss out on the fullness of life that he brings so that's the opposition of the scribes as they're the antagonist uh, in this story but there is another uh, immediate antagonist and we come back to the story of jesus family Jesus' family, uh, they come to take charge of him, it says. Did you know that in other contexts, if it's talking about authorities, uh, the same Greek word is used in other contexts, and actually when it's talking about authorities, it says they come to arrest him. So they come to not just to sort of gently take charge of him, they, they want to they they get him out of there. Okay? They come to take charge of him because they say he's out of his mind. You know, he's, he's not right in the head. He's, he's out of alignment somehow. Okay? You see, again, just the, the connection between uh, things not right in the head or, or illnesses, mental illnesses even, and, and the work of, of Satan, the work of the antagonist. The antagonist is at work. Now, this, understand, is the response of those who love Jesus. This is his family. This is his mother. This is his brothers and sisters. Those who love him. But... If they have their way, the effect of what they do will be the same as if the scribes had their way, the effect would be the same. The ministry of Jesus would be shut down. 
it would come to an end. It would come to an end in different ways, but the effect would be the same. Jesus would end up stop doing what he's doing. They both want the same thing in that. Recognizing the antagonist in harsh words, in conflict, in name-calling, in vilifying, in dehumanizing, that's kind of easy, isn't it? At least when we're standing outside of that, it's easy. We can say, oh, the antagonist, you know, the evil one, evil is at work in, in that. Absolutely. We can recognize that. But what about when it comes in words of love and care? Couched in words of love and care. What about when it comes in, in you know, possibly family or close friends? That's, that's a lot more tricky, isn't it? But here's the reality. The reality of the antagonist. The antagonist is just as at home and uh, being at, at, at work in family dynamics as in harsh conflict evil words, name-calling, whatever the case may be. And Jesus' response to this, when his family comes, Jesus' response seems to us, to our ears, at least to my ears, seems kind of understated. You know, oh, your mother and brothers are here. He looks around, who are my mother and brothers? All who do the will of God are my mother and brothers. It seems so, you know, just sort of, sort of calm, so calm, and, and we've heard it, I've heard it so much that kind of like, yes. I, I get that. That's good. But understand, at that time in his context, what Jesus said was absolutely scandalous. Shocking. How on earth could you say that about your family? Are, are you, are you, you're, you're rejecting your family. You know? The, our Western cultural expectations may be that as children grow, they're going to leave the house, they're going to go out, and they're going to kind of form their own community. I have a daughter now in Ottawa going to university. I think it's wonderful hearing about the relationships that she's forming, the church that she's going to, that she feels, I mean, St. Andrews will always be her church, but, you know, she's, she's found this church that's kind of, that's her church, that she goes there and she's made friends. She, it's her pastor. She's never had a pastor before. Well, she has in Bert and, and in other people like that, but you know what I mean? I think that's wonderful. But in different cultural expectations, moving away from the family would, would be shocking. How on earth could you move away? You're going to live next door. You're going to live in my house. Certainly at that time and, and in some cultures today, that, that, that's still at work. And so to what to some people may sound like not very much was shocking at the time. Who are my mother and brothers? My mother and my brothers and my sisters are those who do the will of God. Shocking. And the antagonist is at work in this too. Because the antagonist can be at work in family and loving relationships. Now, understand what I'm not saying. I, I, you're not allowed to go home and say to your significant other or to your children, to your parents, the pastor said you are the devil. No, that is, that is not what I'm saying. So be careful with that one. Uh, but what I am saying is, is, is that Satan can be at work in, in what, comes, what is, is meant or what comes across, what is couched in loving uh, words, loving actions, and they can be used to hide uh, negative motivations. Think about this. How about, how about parents who can't let go? Is, is that loving their children or is it smothering their children? How about, uh, how about grandparents who smother their grandchildren with love really because they're making up for what they perceive to be or what could be their very real failures with their own children. But it's kind of happening at the expense of their children who are now the parents trying to care for the, their children. It's couched in loving terms, but it's introducing conflict and difficult things into family. You know? How about guilt trips? Does that ever happen in families? No. No. You know, it might not come out in quite so, so, these so many words, but how about things like, but, but don't you love me? You know? Manipulation and, 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 and guilt gets, gets used like that. Now, Jesus doesn't reject his family, really, but he points to a more important category, the category of doing God's will, the category of, of being part of the kingdom of God, because that's where the kingdom is breaking in. He says, Jesus says, whoever does God's will, what does he say in the middle of, of his prayer? 
his kingdom prayer. Thy kingdom come, and how does thy kingdom come? What's the next line? Thy will be done. Where God's will is being done is where the kingdom is breaking in, where the kingdom is at work and where we need to submit ourselves to God's kingdom. So as difficult as it may have been for Mary and Jesus' siblings, uh, those, those words, that response, it's actually quite a, quite a beautiful image, a wonderful image. It talks about the, those seated in a circle around him. He looked at those seated in a circle around him. And so who's that? Is it the 12, the 12 apostles he's just named? Yes, definitely talking about them. But he doesn't just say he looks at the 12, because often in the Gospels it talks about he says to the 12, he calls the 12, he, you know, whatever, he's with the 12. Here it just says, those seated in a circle around him. So it clu- includes the 12. It includes the, the crowd, those who are listening, whoever's house he's in, I suppose. But understand that circle is also open. Those who do the will of God. Those who want the will of God. So guess what? That circle is open to you. That circle is open to me. All who do the will of God, who will submit themselves to that, who will come into the kingdom, step by step. There's a new house. There's a new family of God centered on Jesus and in Jesus where God's will is done, where the kingdom of God is breaking in. And ultimately, that's what the parables are all about. That's what the story is all about. That's what the revolution is all about. Let's pray. God, that, that's, that is what it's all about. Your revolution, your life-changing, life-giving revolution, the way of turning things around. And God, I know. I know from my own experience um, that when these difficult things happen in families that it, it, oh, it's tricky. And most of the time, we don't even recognize it, don't even know it, because, well, just this is family. This is what family's like, isn't it? So, God, I pray, first of all, and maybe more easily, that you would help us recognize when outside of us, maybe whether it's in our online uh, actions or in our listening to the, the news or uh, just hearing about our difficulties at work between coworkers. I pray that you would help us to see the antagonists at work in those places, yes. And, and give us wisdom to know how to be your people uh, doing and knowing and doing the will of God. Lord, when it comes to those who are, are especially close in our relationships of, of love and, and care, Lord, we know that you weren't rejecting uh, your mother, brothers, and sisters there, but opening our eyes to something broader, something ultimately more important. And so, Lord, give us wisdom about how to, how to, how to navigate these things. Imprint the words of oh, I'm gonna say 1 Corinthians 13 on our hearts. Love is patient, love is kind. Love is not easily angered, it does not boast. Lord, help us to know what love really is. Because sometimes our experience of what we call love is not always very loving. Lord, help us to be your woman, your man, your person in our families, sharing your love, what really is love, opening our eyes to what is good and what is not so good, and giving us wisdom to know how to, how to be your person, how to be, how to be your follower in the midst of all of that. Because, Lord, we thank you so much for our families. Where would we be without them? We thank you for the way that you are at work in our families. Your grace is pouring out upon us. Lord, help us to see, to receive, and to be changed by your grace and your truth. Because Jesus is the one who came full of grace and truth. 
And so it's in his name and by his authority that we speak against powers of evil. We speak against the work of Satan in our lives and in the lives of those we love. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit. Amen.